Dak Prescott and Dak and the Cowboys have until July 15th to reach an agreement on a long-term deal. Or else, the quarterback will have to play on the franchise tag this year. But this negotiation has been dragging on for a year, and the constant back and forth raised a lot of questions about Jerry Jones' intentions. Acho, get this one right, please. You think the Cowboys actually want Dak to play on the franchise tag this year? Marcel, let's keep it quiet. I'm going to tell you a secret. Of course they want him to play on the tag. Of course. Really? Of course. Bro, peep this. If the Cowboys win this year with Dak on the tag, well, guess what? You won the Super Bowl. Mm. You won it while he on the tag. Mm. All sins are forgiven. Mm. All drama is forgiven. You won a Super Bowl for the first time in, if I can do my math, over 20-plus years. Yeah, you yeah, want that yeah, thing. Yeah. You got that thing. Got that. So you're not worried about it. Nope. But if the Cowboys lose, which, if I'm being honest... I think in the back of Jerry Jones' head, he is concerned about, then guess what? You didn't commit to Dak long term. You paid him 31, oh, 32 M's, whoa. and he out the door. I think that Jerry's like, look, bruh, we found Dak in the fourth round. <clears throat> we playing with house money. We stole off Dak. We stole off Dak's rookie year. Fourth round money ain't no real money. So mm. I think Jerry, in the back of his mind, is like, hey, Dak, mm. you playing off the tag? It's a win for me because two things can happen. We win the Super Bowl, in which case I'm not mad about it. I got you and I got a Super Bowl with you on the tag. Or we go 8-8, eight and 9-7, eight, and 10-6, and, and, and I'm going to reassess, <coughs> but that reassessing only cost me $30 million instead of a long-term $120, $110 million commitment. So do the Cowboys want Dak on the tag? Well, you better believe it. Hell no, they don't want him on the tag. But that was a compelling argument. Thank better you. than I ever anticipated coming <laughs> from the other side on this one. But you got to remember, let's walk through your steps. And I'll tell you why they don't want it after I use your logic against you. If they win a Super Bowl with Dak and he's a free agent, you think they want that to happen? This is the same Cowboys organization that Dak is our quarterback for the future. Mm -hmm. So you think they want him to leave? No. You think he's going to be more expensive then Absolutely. or now? More expensive. Mm -hmm. Now, if they don't win a Super Bowl, they go 10-6, and six, losing the playoffs like they normally do. What do you think they're going to do now with the quarterback of the future that's still on their roster? They still want to keep him. And if you want to keep him, he's still going to be more expensive. So this is why Dak has all the leverage. And this is why the Cowboys are sitting there like, no, we don't want him to play on the tag. We want him to take this five-year deal. The reason why they're at an impasse with this five-year deal is simple. Dak had an agent before. I don't know if he was good, great, or bad. But the point is, they got kind of close to a deal. And then all of a sudden, Dak switched his agent. And then here comes Todd France with one of them type of suits on. <laughs> Say, uh oh, no, no, we're not taking less. We're going to hold out. We're going to bet on yourself. You know why? Because if you bet on yourself, you have the potential to make $123 million in the next three years. So Dak last year, they offer him a $33 million per year. All of us would have taken that mm -hmm. deal, right? Dak's like, hell no, nah. my Todd France homeboy just told me not to take that deal because there's three years, 123 out there. Last week, what happens? Or this week, it feels like. Patrick Mahomes signs a deal. And in the first three years of that deal, Todd France looking like I told you. What does Patrick Mahomes, who broke the bank, make in his next three years? 63. $63 million. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, that's the worst I can do in the next three years. So that's why Jerry wants him to take a uh... five-year deal right now to lock him in at a number that is going to be lower than if he has to give him 123 for the next three years and then re-sign him to a mega deal after it. You know, Simple math. It's interesting, Marcel. It's, Simple it's math. interesting, sir, because you had a, 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 a long, outstanding career. And what's crazy is, after being so far removed, it's as if you've forgotten that the <laughs> NFL has a 100% injury ratio ooh. because you're counting ooh, money that ooh, da Dak ooh, is yet to ooh, make, Marcellus. Ooh, yes, that's yes. what's so, so mm, interesting. Mm, See, that's how you go broke. Mm, you start spending money mm. that you ain't got yet. You talk about Dak making 123 in the next three years. That's assuming he gets tagged, you're it, tagged, you're it, tagged, you're it. That's not going to happen. It's happening so far. Not gonna, he, he, might, he might get tagged once. He's, uh, what do you mean, might? He's already tagged. <laughs> he's, he's tagged I know might he, He's tagged, but once. Okay. But now, after this season, what do you think the Cowboys going to do? What they gonna They're do? going to assess the situation. Or they could Kirk Cousins it. Oops. And, and they ain't get tagged again. They get that, tagged again. But that's still only 67 mil. Yeah, and that's it's still... still it's still more than Mahomes going to get in three years. <laughs> Keep talking to me, brother. My, my point is this. <laughs> What's your point? Okay. Why? My Why? point is this. The Cowboys going to win. 
Because how are they going to win? Oh. If they're ever going to pay Dak long-term money, oh. he would have won a Super Bowl. And you don't oh. think Jerry would pay 120, 150 mil for a Super Bowl? Big dog. You, you, first of all, you keep talking about this injury rate. It's 100% in the 100%. league. You're right. Actually, it's 99.9 because Dak has never been injured. Oops. <laughs> Dak's never been Some hurt. Some people get hurt twice. <laughs> Dak's never been hurt, so it's not 100%. Dak is so smart. I love you, Todd Fran, CAA, CAA, same over here. The TV deals, Monday Night Football deal is up 2021. CBS, NFL, NBC packages come up in 2022. Mm -hmm. The reason why Dak is wanting a four-year deal, because he wants the shortest deal to get back to the table when they now have the Brinks truck backed up because of the TV deals. Jerry's smart, too. Jerry's like, damn it. He knows this. I don't want him to go back to the negotiating table that fast. I want to make him wait one more year. That's the only thing at play. In all seriousness, I've never seen a situation like this play out where the guy is not the greatest, but he has the greatest leverage maybe we've ever seen. Like, Patrick Mahomes is sitting there now, once he hears this conversation at least, like, how did I get got in this situation? And I'm just talking financial. I don't know how mm -hmm. Dak's going to play. I don't know how it's going to play out with the team. But financially, in terms of that consideration, Dak holds all the cards. Coming up, one of Aaron Rodgers' teammates says Jordan Love won't be a distraction this year. We'll tell you if we're buying it next. Speak for Yourself, presented by Hyundai. Welcome back to Speak for Yourself, presented by Hyundai. Let's move to Green Bay, where things have been pretty interesting since the Packers shocked the NFL and Aaron Rodgers, trading up to draft Jordan Love in the first round. But one member of the team, tight end Mercedes Lewis, yeah, he doesn't think the quarterback situation will be a distraction because Rodgers is a, quote, grown man mm. who's had to deal with all kinds of <clears> stuff <throat> in his career. We're joined now by the one and only, the most stylish, LeVar Aaron. You think? But, Marcellus, oh, I'm going to start with oh, you. I couldn't get you. That little I'm, man on his shoulder. I'm going to start with you, Marcellus. Are you buying that Jordan Love won't be a distraction <laughs> for Aaron Rodgers? <laughs> oh, man, I want to buy this so bad because Mercedes Lewis is my dog, my friend, my former team. Made, and he makes a ton of sense. Uh, but I'm a historian of the game. Mm. And the historian in me is looking at that item on the register right there saying, I can't buy it. I can't buy it. It, it doesn't make sense for me. And I'm going to tell you why. To be a living legend, you, you think you're Teflon. You think that nothing ever has come to a living legend and thrown them off track. But I have a couple of names here that uh, will make you think different. John Elway, you guys know him. He was my favorite football player growing up. Amazing Hall of Famer, duh, Super Bowl champion multiple times. Had one of his worst seasons when they drafted in the first round Tommy Maddox. I'm talking about not one of his worst, the worst. Ten touchdowns, 17 interceptions. Oh, just because they drafted someone, maybe? And you say, oh, that's, that's just coincidence. That's not real. How about one Brett Favre? <laughs> when they drafted you, Aaron Rodgers, you know what Brett Favre just happened to do that year in 2005? Go 4-12, and 12, his worst year up to date in his career. So when I start looking at other living legends at the position that actually suffered once they drafted that position, you can say all you want. I'm good. Mm -hmm. You can say all you want. Oh, I ain't tripping on little man. But the reality is you know you don't feel the same amount of love. And somehow, some way, at least it's happened a couple of times, you don't produce mm. the same amount on the field. Mm. Talk about it. Mm. I don't buy that rhetoric. That's uh, uh, rhetoric. Listen, here's rhetoric. the thing. Facts. You no, have in order. Yeah, it's factual information wrapped up with rhetoric is what that was just now, what you just did, which is fine. It's fine. Bit, bit. But but here's what I'll say. Much like the rhetoric we heard at the top of the show with, with Acho talking about players want to win Super Bowls versus get super MVP, like MVP. Yeah. No, 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 no. You want to make sure that you're handling your personal business to be looked at in as most flattering possible way as you can. And Super Bowls don't necessarily mean that, and neither does bringing in Jordan Love. I'm looking at Aaron Rodgers, and I'm buying the fact that this is not confusion. You know why? Aaron Rodgers is, is a first ballot Hall of Famer. Mm -hmm. Aaron Rodgers has real estate. When <laughs> I say real estate, he has bought goodwill with what he has been able to accomplish. He still has great football left. The magnitude of which what it would take for one Jordan Love to actually come in and play at a high level 
while Aaron Rodgers is still on that roster seems really absurd for any coach or organization to put a player in that possible position. That's one. But then secondly, we continue to try to paint this narrative of a negative thought of Jordan Love being drafted when he was. I don't really understand, as it praying for Aaron Rodgers' downfall, does somebody have a problem with Aaron Rodgers? Like, why is this such a negative thing that we're making that, oh, my gosh, Aaron Rodgers needed all of these weapons, and they traded up, and they didn't take a weapon for Aaron Rodgers. They took his replacement. Well, maybe he is his replacement. But the last I checked, this is professional football, and as Mercedes mentioned so well, this is a grown man that has been doing grown man for things for many years. To sit here and think that that's going to become a distraction to him, I, I don't buy that at all. Ah, LeVar, oh, LeVar, LeVar. Please get him. There's one thing we all know Good. about history. History, sir, it has a tendency to repeat itself. But let's address something, because whenever you use big words like rhetoric, we have to define them, because sometimes people can get lost okay. in, 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 such, in such definitions. Rhetoric, the art of effective persuasive speaking. Let's talk about yes. rhetoric. What? Let's talk yeah. about the rhetoric of Aaron Rodgers. 2017, he says, we need to reload. We need to have a big offseason. We don't need to rebuild. We need to reload. Spoiler alert, the Packers didn't reload. Mm. 2018, mm. Packers get rid of Aaron Rodgers' as quarterback coach, Alex Van Pelt. A-Rod comes out and vocally says, well, my quarterback coach didn't get retained. I thought that was an interesting change without consulting me. Mm. Huh. Let's talk further about rhetoric. 2020, LeVar, you just asked, why do we act as if the Jordan Love, Jordan Love drafting was a negative thing? Why are we painting this brush? Maybe because Aaron Rodgers handed us the brush when he said, I wasn't thrilled by that pick. So we're not necessarily painting the brush. We aren't Da Vinci. We aren't Picasso. We aren't the artist. We're simply taking the brush that Aaron Rodgers gave us, and we like, well, you gave us a paintbrush. I guess we got to paint. Go in the towel, LaFleur. Go in the towel. Throw in the, throw in the, throw in the towel. Did, did you guys not see me yawn at that argument? Like, are we kidding me? He put are you to sleep. Me on he did put you to sleep. Draft? It actually put me, I almost fell asleep just now. Hey, there was a draft that took place this year. There were a few times where we saw quarterbacks taken in this draft where it, you might have scratched your head. Like, mm -hmm. wow. Jalen Hurts, why take Jalen Hurts? Take someone else. Jalen Hurts could, in, in reality, end up being a better quarterback than Wentz. Now, we're looking at a, a changing of, look in Baltimore. You got, you got RG3, you got Trace McSorley, all on one team, all on one roster. What you guys are failing to look at is the evolution of what's taking place in the National Football League right now. You're looking at it as they didn't reload by bringing in a quarterback instead of bringing in another player. But if you're looking at it and you put on your, your GM's cap, what you're really looking at is reloading. And they're adding, adding options, adding dimensions. They may use Jordan Love this year to do rollout passes to do different things that, that may be a dual quarterback situation. They are moving in a direction now in the National Football League where you don't have to be married to one singular quarterback. You can have more than one capable quarterback on your roster. I don't see why y'all think this is so funny. You I'm just speaking sense for y'all. I'm just speaking sense for y'all. Kill the dead. Let me tell y'all what LeVar just said. Nothing. And I hope y'all okay. got DVR okay. so y'all can rewind this. Okay. okay. So okay. he ended his argument by saying you can have more than one capable quarterback on the roster. Sure. But he started yeah. his argument by saying, why did the Eagles draft Jalen Hurts? Well, first off, let me start with that. You draft yeah, Jalen Hurts because the Eagles historically had a backup quarterback take them to the Super Bowl and win the Super Bowl for him just three years ago. So that's why you draft Jalen Hurts. Oops. But you contradicted yourself, LeVar, by the exterior and by the beginning of your argument. The beginning and the ending, that is. But let's dissect the middle of the argument. Dissect it. Let's pick I'm still this trying thing to hear apart. <laughs> Drafting Jordan Love. Why are you upset about that? Why are we upset about that? Because the Packers yes. didn't have a 1,000-yard receiver last year. Ooh. Only eight teams in the National Football League didn't have a 1,000-yard receiver last year. And the Packers were one of those teams. The other teams led by rookie quarterbacks. And so when the Packers desperately needed help the most, because you still have an iconic quarterback in Aaron Rodgers, they said, wait a second, 
all these first-round receivers, C.D. Lamb, Henry Ruggs, all these guys, you know what? Let's take Jordan Love. It don't make no sense, mm. and it will disrupt the team because it's mm. already disrupted the team and disrupted A-Rod. Marcellus. Man, I hate the pile on. Rhetoric. And you know me, I I'm 280-plus right now, so it's going to hurt. But I'm about to jump on this pile, too. You said, and I quote, Aaron Rodgers won't be phased by this because he's a grown man. How dare Correct. you think that John Elway wasn't a grown man and Brett Favre wasn't a grown well, man when they were you phased? Made that. When they were, you made it that. When they were phased by a you first rounder that. being drafted. My point taken. Now, here we go. I'm going to give you <laughs> two more line items that you need to digest, my man. One, All right. no one has factored in this equation, and it has happened time and time in the NFL, called injury. Mm. I'm going to give you a Drew Bledsoe who signed a $100 million deal, 10 oh. years, oh. got knocked out in the first year of that deal, and then Tom Brady the GOAT comes and saves the day. There's no more Drew Bledsoe. Let's go to Alex Smith, who was out there, just got concussed. Like, Coach, I can still remember the playbook. Let me get back in. Uh-uh. Colin Kaepernick took that thing and ran all the way to the Super Bowl. Yikes. Then I'm going to bring it home now. I got two more for bring you. Bring it home. Rob Johnson signed a five-year, $25 million deal after starting only one game for the Jacksonville Jaguars, became a Buffalo Bill, one of my teammates. And because of that money, you know he going to play. And that's big money back then. And all of a sudden, this exiled little dude by the name of Doug the Great Doug Flutie, Douglas who had to go to Canada, is sitting there once again in the NFL, finally, but without a real opportunity because he's behind the money man and Rob Johnson. But what happened after the third game? What Rob happened? Johnson got hurt. The and then Flutie <laughs> came in. Flutie mania, Flutie flakes, and we were in the playoffs. All of that said, I'm going to give you the last one because I like to personalize my story. Personalize. Personalize it. There was a guy who is the greatest of all time that LeVar and I know very well by the name of Bruce Smith. Bruce Smith had 14 sacks the year they drafted me. So no way I'm going to play. No way. I'm just a backup. The next Bruce Smith, which I was not. And then the next year he goes out there and he gets 10 sacks. Okay. Then he gets seven sacks. Okay. And then you know what? What happened? They saw a little cheaper version right there. And it wasn't even because of injury. They just saw cheaper. So it's either injury or we got a little cheap little option there. And they chose me over the Bruce Smith. The point is, if Aaron Rodgers gets hurt, he better look out for Jordan Love. Mm -hmm. Or he doesn't produce and they see that cheap option looking good in practice, you got a problem in Green Bay. That's look every out. year. That's more rhetoric. Go ahead. Give some more rhetoric. Go ahead. <laughs> get us out. The rhetoric, some more rhetoric is they coming up. Saquon Barkley and Christian McCaffrey <laughs> just topped a new list of the NFL's best running backs. We'll tell you who we'd rather have next. Speak for Yourself, presented by Hyundai. Oh, man. Welcome back to Speak for Yourself, presented by Hyundai. That was great. Let's talk running backs now, specifically Saquon Barkley and Christian McCaffrey, who just topped ESPN's ranking of the top 10 backs in the NFL this season. Both of these guys have put up monster numbers in their young careers, and they're pretty close across the board. We're both averaging just under 80 yards per game, over 1,000 per year. Ton of touchdowns with McCaffrey getting more scrimmage yards, while Saquon has more big, explosive plays. LeVar Arrington is back. <laughs> I don't know how. Uh, I chose. He survived. Start with you. Who would you rather have, Saquon or McCaffrey? Uh, this one's easy for me, gentlemen. I'm going with Saquon Barton. Uh -huh. And I'm going with Saquon because, again, I don't just take the lazy approach and say, well, who's better on their teams? That's lazy, gentlemen. Can we work a little bit harder on this show? Can we work a little bit harder and say, who would be the best player regardless of their team? And it's simple, it's Saquon. Look at Saquon and what he does from a big play perspective. Saquon and McCaffrey no. both have started for two years. But Saquon, he's broken 67 <laughs> tackles as opposed to McCaffrey's 52. Now, McCaffrey is a big play guy, high volume receiver. But Saquon, he's got 24 carries of 20 plus yards to McCaffrey's 12. Now, it's so hard to differentiate between like really great and a really great er because they are both elite and the top two running backs in the league. But McCaffrey is known for being a high-volume receiver. He set NFL records catching the ball. It's exactly what he does extremely well in addition to running the ball. But remember, they target him eight times a game. I'm going to catch three or four of them joints, but he does catch seven. So when I'm specifically looking at a running back, in a big picture, not just the team they're playing for, when I'm really looking at who would dominate, whether they're playing for the Cleveland Browns, the New York Giants, oh. the Dallas Cowboys, it's Saquon Barkley <laughs> before it is Christian McCaffrey. That's no doubt about it.
Man, will you stop with this hypothetical Frankenstein you always want to use? If you played here and you played here, I'm just going to be lazy then. <laughs> I, I'm going with Christian McCaffrey, and I know where he plays. Talk he plays in Carolina. Now, let's start off with a video first because I just got to set the table. Uh, I want you to see how C-Mac avoids hits. Look how gentle this mm. is. Is this flag Ooh. football? Oh, no. This is what you Ooh, want your kids butt. to go out there and do. Uh. Mom's out there. This is not what you want your sons to do. Take hits like that. God, Lord, Saquon Barkley. You ain't long for that. Let's look at this again. Avoiding hits. How gentle this is. Oh, where are my flags? Don't touch me, please, everybody. And then look at this hit right here by Saquon Barkley. He's going to take it. Another one. Boom. Now, I only say that because the people, the evaluators who, who did this survey, Went out there, and one exec says, and I quote, oh, you know what? This was nonsense, as he puts it, because <laughs> C-Mac is not as sturdy as Saquon Barkley. Who has missed three games in their career, career Saquon or McCaffrey? Saquon. Saquon. Who has not missed a game in their entire career? McCaffrey. Now let's go. This is my fun part. Third tailback in history to post 1,000 yards rushing and receiving outside of Marshall Falk and Roger Craig, who changed our imagination of how to play the position. Here's more fun. First player ever with 2,500 rush yards and 2,500 receiving yards. First player ever. Oh, let's talk about leading the league in scrimmage yards since he's been in the league. 303 receptions in his first three seasons, second to only who? Michael Thomas, who is a great receiver. And then let's talk about, oh, Saquon. Fewer games played, more games missed. Two-game stretch where you had 27 carries, only 29 yards. The point of this is I, 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 it's, it's not close, even though it is close. And here's some trivia, because I only have one lap to go around. Who led the NFL in negative rush attempts <laughs> since they've been in the league? Christian McCaffrey or Saquon? Saquon. Here's a fun fact. 19 players had more rushing touchdowns than Saquon Barkley, and 15 had more rushing yards. Rewind that on your DVRs, ladies and gentlemen. It's Christian McCaffrey, the winner. Wait, wake up, LeVar. Wake up. You know, because you got to kill him people off. Lean so, people lean so deep into stats. People, people like yourself who have gone to Columbia look at things that really in reality are immaterial to the results of a real debate and discussion. When we're talking about who would you rather have between the two as a running back, it's very simple and it's very easy. You go with Saquon Barkley. While both are freaks, both are physical freaks in what they're able to do, but one is a super freak. <laughs> and Saquon is a super freak genetically and physically. He is able to do oh, things that other running backs or no other running backs are capable of doing. Now, you use that video to show the fact that Saquon takes big hits and McCaffrey doesn't. That's, that's, that's wonderful how you move the goalposts to, to illustrate and write an argument that makes it seem as though Saquon gets hit hard all the time while McCaffrey never gets hit. He is the one getting injured. Where, My fault. That's, He's well, the one getting injured. A high an, well, it was a high ankle sprain. And, and I know the injury, but it's still an injury. He missed three games. As, as, Acho, as Acho mentioned, it is 100% yes. no, that, fact that Dak you are going to Dak and McCaffrey have not injured. missed games. Keep going. All right. Well, there, and it's, it's still, there's still time. There's still time. If I'm building my franchise and I'm looking at the draft and I'm looking at the board and Christian McCaffrey and Saquon mm. Barkley are both on that board and you're sitting here and you're going to tell me you're going to take Christian McCaffrey over Saquon Barkley over the things that you just used, I'm not taking that. You know why? Why? Because play calling, play calling oh, has a whole lot to do with what it is that you're saying. Team franchise has a whole lot to do with what it is that you're using as your argument. I was telling the truth. Saquon this doesn't dictate if he's getting those pass plays called. Saquon doesn't dictate what the mm. offensive scheme the is, truth. and oh. neither does Christian McCaffrey. Oh, the so the bottom line is, is what Ancho just said is 100% correct. You put a guy like him on the same team that Christian McCaffrey's on, you may see different stats than even what you see mm. with Christian McCaffrey Freak, based Freak upon up. the play calling. Not because of the, the the ability that those guys had. You made an argument about play calling, not about the player. 
and I'm gonna leave it there. Oh, leave oh, it. all it that, there. all that Penn State bias just came yeah. out. We are, we are lying. You, can use that. you are lying. You, can use that. you know you damn can use well that. that Christian McCaffrey has the numbers and the game to support being chosen over Saquon Barkley, but the Penn State lenses just won't let you see that. Oh, Coming please, up, they want LeBron games. and four KD games. have taken yeah. a ton of heat during their careers. But now one prominent <laughs> NBA player says racism is to blame. We get into that next. Speak for Yourself, presented by Hyundai. Welcome back to Speak for Yourself. Let's move now to the NBA, where issues of social justice are on everybody's mind these days. In fact, J.J. Redick just did a wide-ranging interview and made some interesting claims about why players like LeBron and KD have faced so much criticism for their career decisions. I think an underlying... I, I really believe this. An underlying reason for the sort of the reaction to Kevin and LeBron making those decisions is because people were uncomfortable with powerful black men making a decision for themselves. I really believe that. That goes back to systemic racism in our society. Joined now mm. by Slick Rick mm. Fox NBA analyst. But Marcellus, I'm going to start with you. What are you, your reaction? To J.J. Reddick's comments. Oh, my reaction. Um, look, I just got to preface everything. None of us should speak for all of us, uh, but I have to generalize since he did. So let's have some fun with this generalization. He's talking to the, the conversation that had, uh, that has been surrounding this about the stay in your place mentality. You know, uh, a lot of times it's a white ownership telling a black player to stay in your place or white society at large telling black people to stay in your place. So I've had this conversation before privately with people and even on the air at times. So I understand where he's coming from. But truth be told, uh, even though it may be truthful, I don't think it's the primary reason behind the backlash of these two players. I think it was more about the players' moves than their skin tone and what that represented. Now, first, let me talk to JJ about the pressure he's feeling. Uh, there's this pressure right now that's going on that tells JJ Reddick, who, you know, lean into being woke right now. That's the climate right now. And if you're going to do that, uh, maybe sometimes display a little revisionist history for the sake of black people to, because of the white guilt and, and, you know, all the things that have been done wrong. Now let's look back and see when did uh, racism when did it occur in the past? When was it applied that we didn't necessarily take notice of in that moment? So I understand where he's coming from. Because I feel that pressure, too, right now. And uh, that pressure is, Marcellus, support the movement, the organization of Black Lives Matter. Why? Because I'm black? Uh, oh, is this because I, that's an automatic membership? You feel that pressure? You have to be a part of something just because you are. And that's the problem. That sounds like Joe Biden to me right now. Let that joke go somewhere else. Now, here's the thing about this, that I know why this is not about racism. If you look at the situation with LeBron James, what LeBron James did, the biggest issue with LeBron James is that on worldwide television, he broke up with his ex-girlfriend. Mm. And then not only celebrated that, had the biggest pep rally and party ever, but moved on to a more beautiful and successful next girlfriend. He did. And everybody just felt that pain, not racism. And you know why it wasn't racism? LeBron and his absolute power didn't hold the NBA hostage and everyone said a black man dare not do that because 20 years prior, Michael Jordan did it not only once, but twice. <laughs> and it wasn't racism when Michael Jordan held the entire NBA hostage. Is he gonna play? Is he gonna play? People were on their knees begging a black man in a more racist time, let's say, if we go backwards. <laughs> and no one acclaimed racism then because it wasn't the issue then, it wasn't the issue with LeBron. KD, KD was different. KD went out there and bucked the code of athletics and sports. In athletics and sports, the worst team gets the best player. And that's the same as even in street ball. If, if I'm playing against you, Slick Rick, and I beat you, and then we lose a player on each of our teams, we both are minus one, and we see two dudes over there, you know who gets to pick first? You do, because you lost. But this situation, the winner got to get the rewards, the Golden State Warriors. The winner got to pick the guy that they wanted. And that's where everybody was like, wait a minute. That's not how the game goes. That's not how the draft goes. That's not how it works on the street. So J.J. Reddick leaned into what everybody is trying to lean into right now. 
which is some revisionist history of racism or the woke moment of the day. But I'm here to tell you, I didn't see racism in either one of these. So I, uh, I got to do something, Marcellus, first and foremost. I got to shout out J.J. Reddick because he has actually been an ally for most of these things and just trying to step up and use his voice. But there's one problem. J.J., you, you can't be like the boy who cried wolf. Because you can't be the, the people who cry racism because what that ultimately does, it undermines true racism when it does, in fact, exist. Mm. Think about the finding of the noose. The, the NASCAR is not a predominantly black sport. So more than likely, who found that noose? I would venture to say it was likely a white individual. And now that whole uproar ended up undermining a cause to some. Something we have to be conscious of. I understand a lot of people are hypersensitive. They are, they are hyper aware right now. There is a lot of guilt right now, but you got to be cognizant. But let's get to sports, because that's what this is. Mm. Wasn't nobody mad about KD leaving because he was black? <laughs> We're mad at KD leaving because he literally was one of the top three players in the NBA then and joined the best team statistically ever in the game's tenure. KD leaving and the backlash he felt had nothing to do with him being black. And how do we know this? Because several people, black, white, and everybody in between was like, man, KD was tripping. KD was a punk. That's a punk move. It was a wise move because you now have a couple championships, but it was still a punk move. Exactly. That's why we was upset about KD. LeBron, to Marcellus's point, a little bit different. I was uh, drafted to the Cleveland Browns a year after LeBron dipped, and it was like that ugly breakup. They deleted all their pictures off Instagram of LeBron. <laughs> they took down their huge posters. They took down their murals. I was walking backstage in the queue in the, in, 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 in the Cavaliers arena, and I was like, where, where LeBron at? He ain't never played here? <laughs> Literally every picture gone. Yeah. So that was an emotional thing, not a race thing. Mm. All right, so at the risk of being accused of the same thing that J.J. Reddick is being <laughs> accused of. Do it, we got you cornered. Do it, I, Yeah. Look, first of all, I got to say two things. Number one, if, if we're playing, why couldn't you use the example that I won and I get to yeah, Hey, man, I write these notes. First, okay? I write these notes. Second, <laughs> second thing, when it comes to, to LeBron leaving Cleveland, uh, it wasn't that he just broke up with her on national TV. It was he said, I'm going to marry you, psych. OK, that's why people reacted the way they did. Yeah, yeah. Now, when it comes to both KD and LeBron and the reaction, I don't believe it's rooted in racism. Yeah. I believe there are a number of branches here, but racism is one of them. There's a couple of others. As you guys have stated, there's elements to what these guys did and the way they did it that just violates the relationship between fans and, and athletes. There is a sense when it comes to fans, that they want their their athletes, their players to be as loyal to their team as they are. And there is a sense of ownership. We drafted you. You belong to us. We've seen other guys, Johnny Damon, Bryce Harper, who left their teams and they were hated for it. Eli Manning, Danny Ferry, guys who refused to go to the teams that drafted them mm. and they were hated for it. But they weren't hated to the same level. It hasn't resonated as long. And I believe there's two things here. One, there's a healthy population, middle class, lower middle class white. It's not just that KD and LeBron are black. It's that they're black and they're rich. Mm. And there oh. is a sense among whites Rick that, preaching now. Um, Ooh, hey, Rick preaching. you guys, you know, it, you're, you're lucky enough to be rich and we made you rich. There's not a sense that that black man created his own wealth is that mm -hmm. he was allowed to be wealth. I think that exists. I would love, by the way, to see what the demographics are on the number of middle class, lower white middle class families that watch the empire uh, or empire versus the Jeffersons. Would love to see what that 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 <laughs> dynamic yeah. is. Hey, but I believe that, look, the, the markets that they left, there were a healthy number of white people, middle class, lower middle class white people in those markets who saw a rich black man who was saying, I'm not only richer than you, or not saying it, but just being it, I am. Yeah. but I'm also, I have independent, I, I'm, I'm independent of you. I don't owe you anything. And I think there's a sense in those markets from those people that yes, you do. And you violated something above and beyond. And so I think there's an element. I don't think it's rooted, but I think it's part of so it. So if Stephen Adams would have left, it wouldn't have been the same? 
No. It, no. No, it would not. <laughs> I <do. laughs> well, 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 speaking of moving on up to the east side, <laughs> coming up, one of Lamar Jackson's teammates says the MVP deserves just as much money as Pat Mahomes. Find out what Uncle Jimmy thinks next. Great point. Welcome back. We're joined now by Uncle Jimmy. Do you think Lamar Jackson um. deserves a bigger deal than Patrick Mahomes? Hey, man, I think that Lamar Jackson needs to be paid like Patrick Mahomes, just like I need to be paid like both of y'all. Hey, man, I have to come on this show every day and clean up for both of you bozos and make y'all look good. Hey, you got so that. Look here, that's suit. hard. That suit. That, that tabernacle suit hey, that you got on right cheap, there. Huh? Hey, that's it, America. See you guys in a week. We're off. Have a good one.